EICON 2017. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. We have to be on time, sorry, because in the next sessions, there are a few national faculty who have to take flights. So we cannot really delay the sessions. Next 90 minutes, we'll dedicate on symposium on bifurcation lesions. May I call upon the stage to chair Dr. Dagubati, sir, Dr. Madhikar, who's perhaps taking lunch at the moment, and Dr. Dhiman Kahali. Dr. Kahali, you are needed here. He's outside. <laughs> Dr. Dhiman Kahali is here. Give me a loud applaud. And for the moderators, Dr. Dev Dutta Bhattacharya, where is he? Yeah, he's here. Dr. Rakesh Yadav. Dr. Rakesh Yadav. Dr. Uttam Shaha. Dr. Dhiman Bonik, you are here, sir. And the session is yours. Chairpersons, I just request you to stick to the time, 12 minutes speech, and three minutes question answer. I will appreciate if you make it two minutes, but I cannot force you because it's written in print. Thank you. <coughs> so, yeah. so good afternoon. We'll start this session number five. Uh, the first speaker, Dr. Madhikar. Uh, who will be talking on my best one of the single stent strategy in Medina 111, bifurcation stenting. 12 minutes speech. 12 minutes speech, two minutes talk. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes QA. Thank you. How many? 12 minutes speech. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairpersons. I start this slide because I, it's a first talk on bifurcation, which I'm sure you're going to see many more complicated cases. I have been given a task of discussing a simple case, which most of us would do in the cath lab with a single stent. What do you see? You see 20% of PCI almost have some kind of bifurcation <coughs> lesion. The, it, at times it is technically challenging. The success rate is not as good as any other bifurcation. You, go, you may get limited flow, some residual stenosis in the side branch. And there are long term major adverse cardiac events with a double stent study. So you have always a choice do with one stent or two stents. And there have been many randomized trials which have looked at this strategy. A provisional stent has shown no difference with the double stent strategy in Nordic registry, which is most quoted. I think it's the largest registry of uh, one versus double versus stent ever done. And most of the good cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, will look at how to do it with one stent. But at the same time, we know that one stent strategy is not always successful. You have to select the patient very, very carefully. DK crush, which was a little small study, has showed that two stents are better than one. So I start with the case. The 75-year-old male, he was diabetic, he was hypertensive, he had recent acute coronary <coughs> syndrome, had a moderate LV dysfunction, and CAG was suggestive of triple vessel disease, but patient was not willing for CABG. Very common. You see these patients every now and then, and you have to answer this question, how I can do angioplasty in the best possible way. Let me share the angiogram with you. So you see a long LED lesion, which involves a medium size, at least 2.75 millimeter diameter. Then he had a circumflex lesion, which you saw, and his RC was total, which was getting retrogradely filled from the left, left system. Again, you can look at the circumflex lesion, which was about 60%. And as I said, the bypass was offered, but the patient was not willing to do, go undergo bypass surgery. So we had to think of doing angioplasty in this gentleman. So when we talk of single stent strategy, I'm just showing you the diagrammatically how you can position the stent, how you can position the wire. It's a step-by-step -step approach. It's a very nice article in Jack, if you want to read further. It's an article on... Uh, bifurcation stenting. So these are step-by-step -step approach and almost you have to do everything except recrossing the stent, which you do with two stents, but you end up doing almost everything that you do in such patients. <coughs> when you answer this question, one stent versus two stent, this is the number of studies which I put together and you can see all the studies possibly that it shows.
that one strength strategy is better than the two strength study, except that double kiss uh, strength, which are DK crush trial, which showed that major adverse cardiac events, especially after six to nine months, were less in the subgroup of patients who underwent double strength strategy. It is understandable because it's a small subgroup of patients, and the vessels were, the anatomy was more complicated, where residual stenosis possibly would cause more ischemia mm. in these patients. So meta-analysis of these all randomized trials demonstrated that both treatment strategies resulted in the similar outcomes in terms of risk of cardiac death, target lesion reversion, and the stent thrombosis. Why discuss this issue? We go back to the patient. We had an option either to put two stents in the same patient, LAD, and then bifurcation stent in LAD diagonal. You could have done mini crush, angle was good, tap, whatever you wanted to, there were all options. But we decided that we wanted to save one stent, and we thought it's a very good patient to just rotablate the diagonal lesion and manage this patient with one single stent. And we always could go back to the diagonal stenting if result was suboptimal. So we decided to go ahead with the one stent strategy. And you can see the post rotablation result. The diagonal lesion looks good. So we just decided to go further with the stenting of the the plain balloon dietation of the diagonal, which was done. You know, we have forgotten the art of plain balloon angioplasty. I'm sure some people in the sitting in the chair will remember that we used to give long balloon dilatations to this patient of one minute. Now, you know, we have lost the patience. Even my resident doctor, before I can say deflate, they deflate the balloon. Before you can say anything. Because they only know inflate and deflate. They have forgotten that long balloon dilatation sometimes can give you long, good results with poor plain balloon angioplasty. So we did plain balloon angioplasty to LAD and then went on to dilate the LAD lesion with a non-compliant <coughs> balloon. And finally, I think it moves. And then you can see the stent into the LAD which was stented. The side branch, what you call side branch, is diagonal as a TME3 flow. Very limited residual stenosis. And we also, also did one more thing. The stent was here was in the synergy. So we went further. We created the access to the branch and re with low pressure. Again, came back to the LED, which is a standard technique to re it. But we did not go ahead with the kissing balloon. Because we thought the result was good, so we did not go ahead with the kissing balloon, angioplasty to the diagonal. So if you have to conclude this very simple topic which was offered to me, that if you decide to go with one stent strategy, it's a good strategy if you could think of it. So we come back to basic principle of medicine. If your mind can think, then only eyes can see. So you have to see the lesion, which can be managed by a single stent. Then you have to plan the strategy, which will allow you to put a single stent and come out almost unless put otherwise. So you know, you need to have these kind of strategies. We discuss, we come up with this. We are not always successful. But around 70% of patients, if you decide to go with one stent strategy, it is possible. But as I said, case selection is very, very important. You cannot just decide that this patient doesn't have money, so I'll do one stent strategy, the other patient has money, so I'll put two stents. That's not possible. You need to evaluate the lesion, you need to evaluate everything, and then come up with the strategy, how to do single stent in this patient. So what are the things we decide? One is to decide good strategy, evaluation of the patient. It needs pre-dilatation. Pre-dilatation also has to be very careful. You can't just go ahead with NC balloon and dilate it at 12, 14, 16 atmosphere to open the lesion. Then you end up in dissection. That's not done, so you have to be very careful. If required, you need to go with some kind of cutting balloon or a rotablation, which I'm sure Dr. Dhal is looking at this case carefully. He's going to come up with something on rotablation or something with cutting balloon. That's what I saw in the program. When to treat stent side branch? That's a bigger question you have to answer. And the most <coughs> common thing is suboptimal flow. If flow is suboptimal, you should think of it. When there's a major dissection to corner that uh, side branch, you are left with no option but to stent it. To avoid all this, you can have rotablation, you can have cutting balloon, and gradual dilatation of the side branch with the old, the, this plain balloon is a good idea. Large vessels, which you try to do with single balloon, like the case like this, you try to do with single, single stent, if you do not get a good result, it may leave a large area for a residual ischemia, and then the patient can come back to you, trouble, to, trouble can be because in form of stable angina or unstable angina of that lesion. So one needs to be very careful when you are leaving the large vessel the way I showed you, without stenting. And most important, because now we are leaving the large vessel behind, you need the access to be created to this vessel. 
So you cannot just miss that step of not recrossing, not going into side branch, not dilating it. So our strategy in such patient is, if we see a long residual lesion which is significant, we go ahead with kissing balloon. If we don't see it, we have used rotamblator or cutting balloon, we would just create an access, dilate it with low pressure, create the access, come back to the main vessel, put another size, regular size balloon, which is of strength size, de deploy it at low atmosphere, 6 or 8, just to make that access open and still stand the uh, strut of the stent which was opened because of this crossing of the side branch. And this kind of technique when we have used, as, as I said, in 60 to 70 percent of patients, we can manage this strategy, but please do understand that th these are super selected patients who can undergo single vessel st stenting and a side branch, no stenting. But you will have to fall back on double stent strategy in these patients at least 30 percent of times because what you plan is not what nature has planned. You cannot leave the suboptimal result in this patient and then you end up with a two strength strategy. And I'm sure next few speakers who are coming to follow, they're going to show all those exotic double vessel, single vessel, complicated angioplasies, which will be worth discussing. Thank you very much. Very nice case presentation, Dr. Mardikar, as usual. You have done very nice rotablation to a small side branch, you know. Beautifully done because there is always chance of some injury over there. So very nicely done. <clears throat> and as you have discussed, that Nordic 3 trial has clearly shown that uh, kissing balloon inflation hasn't got anything much to do, and the difference was very small, 2.5% with kissing balloon, provided you don't put a second state in the side branch. Now the question is that the side branch optimization, that when will end the process, that when will be satisfied, because it is told that suppose such a diagonal branch, if there is 80 to 90 percent lesion also, it is not going to produce angina, neither it is going to produce any increase in mess. Now, how can we define the optimization of the side branch? That uh, we stop the procedure when yeah, we I, think. I, I know. Yeah. You know, it's a very uh, subjective discussion and, and decision which you have to take, but as you do more and more patients, you can make out these patients who have, uh, who will not come back. Very crude method of looking at is, Sometimes I do it on table, inquire the level of angina which patient had. If patient did not have a very significant angina beforehand, he is most unlikely to come back to you with significant angina later. If the effort tolerance was reasonably good, I would not say two minutes of TMT, but if it five, six minutes, he could walk on the TMT at you five, six minutes. These are the patients who possibly may not come back. But finally, you have to correlate angiographic result versus the future possibility of patient coming back. And I still feel that it is your experience of doing so many angioplasties which allows you to take this calculated risk of leaving the side branch without stenting. But I would be hesitant to leave a side branch with 60%, 70% stenosis, which is of at least 2.5, 2.75 millimeter, and going cl close from the lateral wall almost to the apex, not to the apex, but almost to the apex in, like this in this patient. I would be hesitant to not stent it. In this case, if the result was suboptimal, that was our worry. The result could be suboptimal with plain balloon, and that is why we yeah. used the rotablation. Mm. But if I had not used rotablation, I'm almost certain that it would have suboptimal result, and I would have gone and stented this one. Any other questions, Dr. Bhattacharya, or Dr. Bonik? Yeah, uh, just uh, if we can, uh, if I can ask you, what was uh, the uh, logical steps? Uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't look at the picture very well from this far. Was the diagonal ostium very tightly diseased? No, you are it, right. Diagonal, it wasn't. It, it wasn't, but it, it was not even five millimeter beyond. It was almost close to the ostium. The lesion was significant. Okay. It, so, so uh, the uh, your concern was uh, that when you uh, approach the diagonal first, that the diagonal should not go down. Is yes. that right? Yes. Am I right in thinking that? Yes. So uh, you, uh, and uh, the most uh, dangerous area should be the ostium and nearabouts. Right. So that is, the, that is the reason why you did the rotor? No, we, we used the rotor for two reasons. One, it was showing some amount of calcium, patient was about 65, diabetic, and I was almost sure that in second care, the diagonal, the lesion which was just beyond the ostium, we would not get a very good result and then I will end up in stenting. So idea was to... Okay, so if you stent. had to do a future stenting, you were preparing that vessel first. Yes. So that if you had to, if it was not so good, then your bed preparation would be good. Yes. That, that was your uh, logic in doing that. Okay. Uh, so you were, but all the same time, while you were doing it, you were, you had in your mind that you were going for a provisional stenting. It was provisional stenting, but we wanted to, as I said, we almost strategized that if we decide to do provisional stenting, 60, 70% of times we end up doing provisional stenting, as 
30 percent, 70 percent will come up. So as I said, in every patient we don't go with poisonous stenting. In some patients we go with uh, mini crush plant. That this is what we are going to do, or DKDS. We do all these things. But in some select group of patients where we can think of going with single strength to get best possible result, that is what we try to do. So there was a simple case. Thank, so, thank you. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. So DK crush, double kissing crush technique by Dr. Suni Banerjee. The, this is not, <coughs> please change it. So uh, uh, before he changes the slide, uh, we always believe that you should have a single strain strategy in a bifurcation lesion. That's clear. Now there are certain situations where you need a two strain approach. So uh, if you can think of a elective two strain strategy, this is, has uh, come up uh, in recent past as a very good uh, approach that is a decay crush and uh, the short term and long term outcome seems to be favorable. But at the same time we need to know that this patient will have a good number of uh, metal burden and this is an elective procedure. Before we go ahead you need to see that the patient financially can afford it, patient can take a dual antiplatelet therapy for a reasonable time duration and you have the justification to stent both the vessel. So I will show you two short cases and then probably I will go to the method of doing it in an appropriate way. I will start. Okay. So uh, this is a case which uh, presented with, let's see the clinical status. He is a 40 year old gentleman who works in a private sector and can't uh, uh, work after taking meal and uh, he goes to office every day with a reasonable delay and uh, the TMT is positive and uh, significantly positive with a uh, gross ST changes. <coughs> If we see the side branch, it's a good 2.5 millimeter with a good supply of areas. So in this patient who is young, you likely uh, to uh, have a complete revascularization. And it uh, stop Fine. So I think we need to see one thing very clearly, the ostium is tightly diseased, there is a proximal disease and after we do an angioplasty, it is not the question of pinching of the vessel or something. This patient baseline has presented with a significant inducible ischemia and symptom, he is active. So you need to do something for this branch. So that is the reason of doing a two vessel elective angioplasty and I will show you in detail in the next case how we did. The purpose of <coughs> uh, showing this thing is when we check this patient after one year, just for our interest, not the patient was symptomatic, we found that uh, he is asymptomatic although there is a, some proximal progression of the disease and uh, this vessel is doing extremely well and we didn't do anything with the proximal another diagonal which actually got pinched after stenting the LED, after putting the LED stent, we didn't do anything on that. So what we learned from this thing, one is that if you have a pre-existing disease and if you need to achieve a complete revascularization better, you do a double strain strategy. During the procedure, if you have a plug shift and if you ignore it and the vessel is flowing, probably nothing is going to happen in future. Okay, this is the check CG, sorry. So, 
which was reasonably good. Now I come in a in a more uh, a little way in another patient who has presented with uh, rest angina, which is not written here, is elevated troponin and a good LV function. Now, what the angiogram shows? The angiogram shows a relatively good right coronary artery not to be targeted. The left anterior descending artery has two lesions in the diagonal distal D2 or maybe D3 actually, but it is having a slow flow. So probably I presume the symptom of our tropi elevation may be due to this. And there is another lesion in the circumflex. So this dealt separately, but first we tried to address this left anterior descending artery and the diagonal. And if you see the diagonal, this is again not a very small vessel. Although it is significantly diseased at the beginning, but distally it ramifies into two branches, which is at least two millimeter. So let's see step by step how we did the decay crust technique. Probably we'll get some learning and how we do it in day-to-day -day practice. First we dilated the diagonal branch. We take a seven French catheter. With a six French also you can do, but that is sometimes not possible because uh, two stent at the same time uh, we are not giving. So you can do it at the six French, but we found it more comfortable to take the stuff like this. We predilated with a small balloon, and then what we did, we found a reasonable flow in this branch. So we thought at this point that this will be elective two stent strategy approach, not a single stent strategy approach. And this is how you need to keep the stent a little bit into the main vessel. How much? You need to verify in another orthogonal view all the time that you are not supposed to be too much into the left anterior descending artery and at the same time you should not miss the osseum. The best thing is that you put a balloon also at the same time so that your crushing and it's possible after you deploy the stent. So this was a 2.5, 18 millimeter drug eluting stent. And you can see we deployed and then we crushed. What we did then, very importantly, we need to cross this diagonal, preferably with a proximal start. Now, if you have done it like this, actually, and if you have given a good turn uh, uh, card to your vessel, uh, where, guide where, it will automatically go to this proximal. So, so there is nothing uh, more important because the stent is being oriented in such a way now that you are going to go with a proximal start only. And then, what is important to know in other provisional stenting strategy, the option is to go through the distal start, not the proximal start. And then, most importantly, first kissing. And when you choose the size of the balloon, you need to know this law. And this is written very well in the book that what should be the diameter of the main vessel balloon and the side branch balloon. And after we did a first kiss, we took a long stent, 2.7533. And the stent should be, as usual, matching to the distal segment. And probably many a people will take a 2.5. That's fine also, but we thought that 2.75 will be a better one. And we stented it, and then we did a second crush. And the most important thing is the final pot. And this is the final result. What has not come in this picture is the utility of stent boost or IC stent 
or clear stent, whatever is there in your lab, it's the best thing to make sure that your two stent has been overlapped in a nice way. So, in conclusion, decay crush is a most effective way of elective two stent strategy. Don't think that it is a bailout technique. You have to plan accordingly and you need a lot of hardware and you need to justify that this patient will be benefited with these things. In both the cases, the number of disease vessel was limited. She, this patient have a less amount of other factor like valve disease or there is no contraindication for a dual antiplatelet therapy for a long time. Rewiring the side branch two times and kissing two times and final part is essential. I end here and take your questions. Thank you. Very well presented, Shunip. Uh, you have rightly told that the DK crush is a very useful technique and especially after the DK crush 3 trial, it has been categorically shown that the, you know, mess is much less with DK crush 3 even in comparison to the Coulard because EBC European Bifurcation Club has been advocating lot of uh, in favor of Coulard. But in Coulard, there is a proximal two-layer stenting, and it becomes very difficult to recross the side wearing, you know, in a Coulard technique. But it's very easy to go in this technique because in decay crush, after the initial casing balloon inflation with the balloon in the main branch, it becomes very easy to cross into the side branch. Very easy. It becomes very much easy. easier, and that's the difference with the mini crush or crush technique that it becomes. And the DK crush three have categorically showed that it's a much better technique. Any comments, Ramesh, Dr. Mardika? Yeah, one small <coughs> question, Shunip. Yeah. Uh, when you are crushing the side branch stent, you still had a wire inside. How, what is the impact of having a retained wire at the time that you're crushing the first stent? What is the biomechanical impact? Can you complete the crush with a retained wire? Mm. I mean, in the side branch. Yeah. The wire was in the side branch. You did not pull out the wire when you were crushing your diagonal stent mm -hmm. with your, uh, with the right. main, with the LED balloon. So what is the impact of this? No, that is, should not be done. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think uh, that should not be done. It's important to uh, right. tell this, that, right. no, here, uh, can you show it here, please? Like, uh, if you are putting, when you are putting a stand, you are not supposed to keep. No, 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 no. Go you, back. You uh, go back. Go, go back, back one back, slide. Yeah. So, I, I, I also saw that, Anil, uh, that, I mean, obviously, Dr. Banerjee also agrees that uh, traditionally, DK crush, uh, while crushing the first uh, side branch stent, the wire should be removed after a check angiogram, which shows that there is no dissection. Yeah. And, so then you remove the wire and then you crush it. Absolutely, absolutely, right. I, absolutely. I, we all are on the same page, but yeah. uh, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, that's sometimes that's maybe yeah. we are I missed. missed. No, Let me is, see. Uh, it, it happens many yeah. times. Yeah. We see this with many mm. times. Yeah, so I just want to know what, will a crush be complete at all with the retained wire? Because theoretically This one, okay, okay. Yeah. you are saying this one. Yeah. Yes. That is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this wire is trapped, yeah. No, actually, uh, we uh, crushed earlier also. No, yeah, the one before this. Yeah, so, so probably this is the first uh, crush, not a kissing crush. So we have already crushed actually. See, but in the second so, but picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, your yeah. wire is there. Right, right. I got it. I got it. So, so uh, uh, this this is also uh, should be avoided. But uh, if you have done already a uh, good crush at the beginning. Do you think uh, this is going to matter? Because this is through a different way. See, it doesn't matter. You, once you have any hardware through that stent, yeah. you cannot crush that stent completely. So okay, again, the I basic principles of angioplasty, if right. you want to crush something, there you should be take no it hardware. Out. No right. hardware. So I think in the learning phase, yeah. probably you can leave a wire. But yeah. I, I mean, most of us uh, don't leave the wire unless sometimes we just forget and uh, yeah. crush it and then uh, remove the wire. But I, I agree with Anil and all, obviously you also agree. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so we know that uh, the steps of DK crush include that actually you should do a check angiogram after crushing the stent. Absolutely. And I mean after and stenting the side branch and make sure there's no wire before you crush it. 
So very good, excellent uh, talk, and I think we can uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, move on. Please. Thank you very thank much. You. Any thank comments? you. Thank you. Any uh, comments from the uh, Sunip, sorry, I, I know we yeah, are running short present. of time, and the India yeah. India Pakistan match is at three o'clock. <laughs> So, but just two small points. One is that uh, when you were post-dilating, uh, the second uh, kissing, you were using uh, non-compliant or compliant balloons? Non-compliant. Non-compliant, okay. And the other thing is, uh, what I noticed was that when you were deploying the first tent, I, I don't know whether you have shown the complete picture or not, the ostium, the balloon was not fully inflated, which sometimes can happen because uh, the, it is tightest there. So what I sometimes do is, if that happens, is that I deflate it, I pull the balloon back slightly into the LED and I give a bigger inflation yeah, yeah. to open up that uh, strut and Good. then crush it. Then crush it. Yeah, yeah, def definitely. That make, makes the thing easier. Because it is the ostial portion which is the most tightest. Yeah. So if you have uh, doubt in opening the things, definitely you should do that thing. I mean, do a high pressure pulling the balloon proximally because nothing is going to happen. <laughs> You are already putting a stand proximally. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Anil Dhal, please, for your lecture on uh, provisional stenting with utilization of plaque modification, cutting balloon, scoring balloon, or rotablator. Uh, thank you. I think uh, this presentation is almost pedestrian after all those exotic cases which have been shown by people before me. Fosla's brilliant series on left main. It was it was really remarkable. So, uh, I mean, we all know that. All bifurcations are not the same, and you cannot really treat them in the same way. So I'm not going to go through this except to stress on one small point, and that is that I think the angle of the bifurcation and the relative difference in sizes of the main and the side branch remain very important in choosing an elective two-stent strategy. So if we go to the Medina classification, if we have a 0, 1, 1, with the 0 being very clear and there being adequate room, we can still co consider a V-step. If we have an angle which is close to 90 degrees, we should consider a T or a TAP step. And if we have a narrower angle, which is 70 and below, well, if the sizes are equal, please consider a Q-lot. If the sizes are unequal, my personal preference is almost always to use a DKC uh, as for points which Dr. Dheeman has already brought out. And there are differences between various strategies which we know. <coughs> the next important point is that we must have direct imaging of both parent and daughter vessel. Uh, very well brought out by Devdat in the last, as a part of the last case, we must not forget that not only aorto osteal, but even branch osteal has more fibrosis, has more calcium, and has much more elastic recoil. So we must be very sure that we have a possibility of getting direct imaging. Very often, it is not possible. Now, this is a case, I'm not really going to go into it, low calcium burden, young patient, very simply, what did we do? We had a choice of using a non-compliant balloon, but we had a very low profile uh, scoring balloon called Scoreflex, which is just an additional wire available, which did not add to any cost burden. So we actually achieved at lower pressures, we achieved better dilatation, and there, we completed, uh, this is again, this is the same double kissing crush being done <coughs> and, and, and uh, the result being obtained uh, of, with all the steps which Shunip has just shown you and, and this is um, the final result with a, the with a final kissing and so this is a double kissing crush, low, low calcium burden. I could have managed with a non-compliant, but I used a score flex. Now increase the calcium burden, narrow angle, 0, 1, 1, moderate calcium burden, but 0, 1, 1. Again, we looked at it. This is moderate calcium burden. Well, we thought we could manage. So again, this is, this is now with an angiosculpt, 
we get both sides going, we confirm on imaging that the zero remains a zero, there is no dissection, and we actually use a, st a strategy I don't use very commonly, which is like a V stent, but we had a very good result, and we confirm by imaging in both the branches. So we confirm by imaging in both the branches, the patient is doing well. Now let's come to a, a little different situation, a higher syntax score, this is a multivessel PCI. This gentleman had uh, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, uh, one episode of rest angina, uh, inferior MI on ECG, and we have a total occlusion of the right. We have uh, a bad, calcific, tortuous um, LED diagonal bifurcation, and we have a, a fibrotic, almost calcific, um, the CERC OM bifurcation. So we actually, because the syntax was high, we, we, and there was a heavy calcium burden which was visible, uh, we had to do one total occlusion which is at least eight months old. So we had to, we had to handle different issues. So we counseled him for a surgical revascularization as is all interventional meetings. The patient did not consent for surgery. And now we had to think as to what do we do? So we said, first stage, let us decide to open the CTO right. And fortunately, we were successful anti-grade. I did not have to do anything much uh, <coughs> except <coughs> get my angulation right with a, with a bilateral injection and a Gaia 2 actually sailed through <coughs> after an initial problem with, uh, with, a, uh, with a fielder XTA. So then we came back a week later. <coughs> Excuse me. He had a little creatinine rise, and uh, thank you, Sunip. Sunip's hospitality and kindness is, yeah. is truly appreciated. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we, we came back uh, after a week. By the time his creatinine has settled, and said, "What do we do next? Do we do an IVUS? Do we use a road ablation? Do we use a scoring balloon or a non-compliant balloon?" So obviously, we said, let's use an IVUS. The IVUS catheter only saw the proximal <coughs> LED, could not, be, could not be taken beyond it. So, well, if your IVUS catheter does not cross, your decision is already made. You have to rotablate. So we uh, initially wired the diagonal, and uh, this is a 1.5 uh, rotablation to the diagonal. Uh, pull the wire, uh, um, uh, um, now, we wired the, the LED, and uh, this is a road ablation to the LED, and we had both the vessels open. Now, we have to improve the bed preparation. So what do we do? Now, should we use a scoring balloon? Should we use a non-compliant balloon or increase the rota burst size? So we actually went now with a non-compliant balloon, as has been pointed out previously. We went at high pressure, and we had to decide our strategy. Should it be a mini crush? a double kissing crush, a culotte, or a TAP, because the angle was narrow, and you can see the angle is really okay. narrow. We thought that uh, a double kissing crush would be appropriate. So after bread preparation, standard practice, a standard a double kissing crush, and uh, we, well, this is uh, uh, the, 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 the various steps which have been shown, and we had this vessel open uh, quite well. And uh, then we went back and actually did a mini crush for the, the CERC OM, where there was a little rota regret because I did not have as satisfactory a kissing at that stage. But this was still a final, a good result. Four months down the line, he came back and had a thallium done just for his own, uh, his own interest, and it was negative. So again, let's come to a heavily calcified LED D1. This is 111. And here, there is a problem of access, because now there is a reverse bend in the diagonal. So this is a 78-year-old hypertensive diabetic. He had um, an MI um, uh, many years ago when he was in Muscat, Oman. And uh, he, this gentleman came. His RCA was recanalized and reasonable. So we did not have to do anything much with it. But look at his left system. Now, it is seemingly just a tight lesion of the LED and the diagonal. But what do we see is, let's see the anatomical challenges. There is, there is a massive calcium 
which was actually visible fluoroscopically, and this angle, which, which you can see here, defines the difficulty in entering this side branch. So again, we go through the standard exercise. What do we do next? Crusade-based reverse wiring is a very exciting uh, kind of thing, looks very good in meetings, and I thought I, we, we should do it, and then, or we should consider a plaque modification. We all know the reverse wiring technique is to take a twin lumen uh, catheter, uh, microcatheter beyond it, have a reversed wire which, which we actually pull, once you pull back the, the crusade, we can pull back this wire and it enters the side branch. But the problem was, the patient became ischemic just by the wiring of the parent vessel with the fine cross. So what now? What, do, what are our choices? Should we take a 1.5 millimeter rota burr? Should we take a 1.75? Should we do a scoring balloon? Or should we still try a crusade-based reverse wiring or do a direct wiring? Well, we chose a 1.75 burr hoping that this burr would now shave off enough calcium from the LAD D1 bifurcation to enable me to enter. And this we did, high-speed rotational etherectomy, 200,000 RPM, and this is the result we get. Well, the LED looks good, but I still cannot enter that damn diagonal because it is a, it is a reverse loop. So now there were three choices again in my mind. Should I forget about the diagonal, stand in the LED and, and say enough and more has happened, or should I again try the reverse wire loop uh, or should I upgrade my rota burr to a 2 o burr? Should I uh, use a scoring balloon or should I use something else? So what we did here was we used a classic flex stone and uh, we said, all right, we have broken this calcium which is at this edge, which is having this problem. So we, we took a, 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 a flex stone, went at high pressures, uh, about 8 to 12 atmospheres, got a few cuts going in this direction, what did we end? We had slow flow in the diagonal. But what it allowed us was that when we now went back with a Whisper MS and, and we tried, we, we stayed patiently, knowing that we may have broken that little calcific burr, you can see the wire entering and the rest of it is as Shunip described, a double kissing crush was performed, a cutting balloon <coughs> mid-diagonal, then uh, there was an angio post cutting balloon and there was a diagonal was stented uh, the, the proximal stent was crushed, uh, the LED was stented, and, and we finished with the final kissing balloon. Uh, the the, the uh, circumflex lesion was a straightforward after a, a OM stenting. So this was a case which actually showed us how we could, uh, and I'll just play this because this is the final run, and how we could, with a difficult entry also, the use of uh, plot modification helped us re-enter uh, this uh, very difficult or tricky, at least to me, a tricky entry of the diagonal. So that's what I have to say that in case we, we have to, we have already made the decision for elective two strength strategy and we know that we are going to have challenges. We can use different kinds of scoring balloons, score flex, angiosculpt, flex stone, depending on the kind of lesion morphology that we want to do. A scoring balloon allows you more area which you enter at lower pressures, less trauma to the rest of the vessel wall, and use rotablation to not only get off calcium on the way, but also sometimes get off calcium on the side of the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dhan. You showed different techniques in very short time, three different techniques. Just going back to your first case, first case. Was there any alternative strategy in your mind? Sorry? W did you think of any other strategy or this was the only strategy in your first No, we could have, actually that was a simple case. So uh, when you have a simple case, you can choose any strategy. The angle was about 70, 75. I could have used a TAP, I could have used a provisional, I could have used anything. It just depends on what you have most confidence in and what you think you will be able to deliver. So that, that case is not a case that I'm trying to really highlight as to the difference in strategies. All choices were available. We looked, we discussed with the family, we discussed the pros and cons with all the choices. And then we chose what we were happiest And with. any time financial aspects come in your mind or you just Yes, decide? of course, financial aspects do come in my mind. If that patient had said that he cannot afford a second stent, which fortunately, one of the good things after 14th of February is that patients <laughs> very seldom say that now. Once they're in for a penny, they're in for a pound. So uh, my, yes, in maybe a couple of, 
months ago, I would have, I would have tried to do a provisional uh, single strength strategy for Sometimes that. Sometimes it is not becoming affordable for cardiologists to spend so much of time now. Yes, true, but <laughs> I think, I think the result was the the proof of the pudding also lies in the eating. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bonick, any comments? The, in the last case, uh, you have done the uh, Drota. Uh, yes. This was a slight uh, 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 doing a crusade, going. Sir, my, when I took a when I took my wire, initial wire, even with a fine cross, the patient became severely ischemic. So uh, the the diameter of a fine cross is much less than the diameter of okay. a crusade, which is got which can take two wires. So I did not have the guts to try a crusade then. Yeah. Yes, you can say that after I had rotoplated, I could have tried a crusade. But by that time, as everybody is conscious about the financial, uh, you know, impact, I did not now want to open a crusade and say, okay, now I'll let me rewire with a crusade. I think just worked just as well. I had a flex tome which had been used previously, which was lying around, and I thought that 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 worked and gave us uh, the path. It is a little scary when you use a flex tome in a situation like this because the flow slowed down, he again became ischemic and if I had not been able to enter, then what? Then what? Then there would have been challenges. But, well, we, it went according to plan. So. One, one comment. Uh, the case before the last one yeah. where you did uh, rotor to both the diagonal and the LED, yeah. you chose a 1.5 bar. Yeah. What I noticed was when you were doing the diagonal, uh, the diagonal bar, uh, the bar did not go actually uh, very deep no, no, into the did. diagonal it and did. the wire was coming back, which is an indication that you were getting obstructed at the ostium. Can, can we see that yeah, again? Sure, sure, sure. If the, if the chairperson agrees, we can go back. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's for, for my learning. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that was not a problem. Because no, that's, a, that's a right angle bend and it is very, it's, it's a very it difficult a uh, rotor. It is a tricky case. Yeah. Yeah, I have also noticed the wire coming back, but I think it still went into the diagonal. It crossed us. Yeah. Yeah, just show us. This is the LED. Yeah, show us this one. It crossed. See? See, as you want to, it, See, yeah, 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 right yeah, it, it yeah, it did, it did, it did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Save time. Yes. So yes, 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 yes. Okay, very well okay. done, Anil. <coughs> very well done. Thank you, Dr. Dalvi. We are out thank of time. You, thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move on to the next technique, nano crush. Do I see Shonan? I don't see him here. Dr. Shonan, okay, next. Okay. Shubhana. Shubhana is not there. Right? No. The okay, then we want to next state bifurcation stenting. Dr. Taufik Haq. Where is he from? Okay, Dr. Dr. Taufik Haq is from Dhaka. And we have now special representation from Bangladesh. Welcome, Dr. Thank you so much. So, good afternoon, Honorable uh, Chairperson, Panelists, and dear gathering. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here. And secondly, I would also like to thank them because they gave me a blank check saying uh, bifurcation stenting. Uh, so I took the opportunity and banked on it. And actually, I'm going to show a case on bif bifurcation in a situ situation <laughs> and try to avoid all the uh, theoretical discussions. So our patient was a 75-year-old gentleman who landed at our cath lab <coughs> for primary PCI for an inferior microbial infarction. He was diabetic, hypertensive, and initially his ejection fraction was 52%. He also had, he was known to have Greek kidney disease. So to our utter dismay, uh, when we started the procedure, his left side looked like this. He had a LED occluded, totally occluded, and a diagonal from that point, which was diffusely diseased. And right coronary artery, which was the cause of infarction, was tortuous, ectatic, and had 90 to 95% lesion with sluggish flow. So as it was a primary PCI, uh, we decided to do the right coronary artery. Uh, as it was tortuous, we took an AL1, we wired it, and directly stented it with a 4 into 30 dilating stent. It was a, a satisfactory result. So we, uh, we allowed this elderly gentleman to uh, settle for a few days. Also, he had chronic kidney disease. And uh, five days later, after discussing uh, with 
all, we decided to fix the, try to fix the left side. So we had some challenges in our hand. It was a long CTO, and at the same time, a large diagonal branch was coming out from the CTO point. Both of, the, both of these were pointing towards a uh, probability of um, procedural fa failure in a CTO si situation. And uh, as the side branch ostium was offering less resistance than the proximal cap of the CTO, um, we start, here I must say we, we first started with a pilot 50 wire with the help of a microcatheter, then we changed into a conquest wire. But as the ostium of the diagonal was offering less resistance, the wire kept on moving into the diagonal branch. Now, we did not want to make a dissection here and lose the battle altogether. So we decided uh, we would um, first wire the diagonal branch. We wired it and changed the conquest wire for a floppy run-through wire. Now the next situation comes, how are we going to enter into the left anterior descending? Our what were our options? We could use IVAS to uh, look into the, or, or look into the uh, true lumen, or maybe uh, we could put a support wire in the diagonal, change the con geometrical conformation of the LED, uh, LED lesion and try to cross it, or dilate a balloon in the diagonal ostium, which was in close proximity to the CTO, and try to, try to indirectly crack the LED proximal cap. So we took the third option. We uh, actually pre-dilated the diagonal branch. And the diagonal branch looked good. And if you can see, I don't know uh, whether you can see, the f a faint flow of the LED could also be seen. At this point, we again took a conquest wire with a microcatheter and carefully penetrated through the proximal cap into the LED. Again, the wires were exchanged. We exchanged the conquest proof for a floppy wire. We pre-dilated the LED, LED CTO point. And put a 3.5 to 38 millimeter dry eluting stent into the LED. Now, Now we again recrossed into the right coronary artery, uh, sorry, diagonal branch with the LED wire. We pulled back the LED wire and uh, crossed into the diagonal branch, opened up the strut of the diagonal, and planned to put a 2.7524 millimeter drug leading stand with the diagonal branch. After repositioning, we deployed the stent in the diagonal. Then we did kissing balloon dilatation. We did proximal optimization. This was how it looked like. Then we did IVAS into the diagonal from the LED. And here you can see uh, the, LCA, uh, the diagonal branch coming, coming up with uh, well opposed stents. The diagonal with the stent. Then we re did report in the proximal with the high size balloon. And this was the final result. So the take home message is the presence of a bifurcation or trifurcation at the proximal or distal entry point of a CTO has been described as an anatomical predictor of the failure, of failure. 
but wiring the side branch at base condition and the absence of dissection affecting the bifurcation were powerful predictors of technical success. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Yeah, very well done. Okay. Uh, how many days after the primary you have done the second one, LED? Because this was a super dominant RCA and you did a primary PCI to the RCA? Yes, sir. Five days. Yeah. Five days? Five days. Okay. Okay, well done, very well done. Any comments from the... Uh, main uh, important point of this uh, opening of the two CTOs is the after the dilatation of the diagonal, there is a linear line of the LED. Uh, this yes. was the main uh, key point of this doing PCI. Exactly, sir. Thank you. Are you doing retrograde CTOs also? Because uh, this, uh, very, this was a very difficult CTO. Retrograde, we do. Uh, we have done a few cases, but it's not our, not our practice. We don't. Any comments, yeah, I, I was just thinking that uh, this is uh, a practical issue. Suppose we have used Prasugrel mm -hmm. in inferior MI setting and in the same hospital admission we wanted to do this CTO. So what we should do, we should wait for it because uh, if you have a disaster something, it's difficult to control. Just I am asking your opinion, what we should do. I mean, sir, we are helped here by the fact that the patient had CKD. We are not going to prostrugal anyway. But uh, actually in elderly patients, we try to avoid prostrugal. We give uh, clopidogrel. And, and obviously when, when we have another it's difficult situation in our hand, we try to avoid prostrugal and uh, go for clopid. Maybe after procedural success, we move into. But I, I may agree with what is it? In many circumstances, if you wait for a week or few, few few months also, because it's basically CTO, so there's no hurry to go through. If you sometimes end up in complication, you know, it could be more yes, challenging and devastating than the primary PCI that, and the CTO both. Sir, that is very true. In our, in, our, in our center, we have many patients who has done a primary PCI in one vessel and has never come back to fix the other vessel. So because uh, in, I, I'm sure like here also, as it's not reimbursed, uh, as long as they don't fail, fall into big trouble, they will not come and fix. But we don't want to leave this patient with LED occluded. So I think uh, the case is very well done. And although theoretically we may question the choice of strategy as far as, uh, you know, because it's a narrow angle LED D1 bifurcation, but the very fact that you have finished by imaging actually gives a lot of credibility to the procedure you have done. And which brings us to a, the moral of the story for all of us, is that whatever we may do, if we finish by imaging, we will, we will be much more confident when we go home that evening. Thank you, sir. That's right. Very good. Excellent. Sorry, sir. Use the mic. When you deployed the stent in the diagonal, did you use tap? Yes. 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 That's a, that was a tap technique. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you are such a narrow angle, you cannot keep the protrusion to being just a little protrusion. So, yeah. And that is a, but you finished with imaging, yeah. that's, right. that's why so you scored I, <coughs> I was going to make a comment saying that probably this one would have been best served with either DK Crush or Coolot, but uh, I thought I would not say it because you did uh, imaging shows very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thank, Thank you, sir. So next, it's my great pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Diman Kahali, who is already at the podium, to give his talk. He's the chief advisor from ICON. For ICON. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Kahali. Ramesh, for your kind introduction. So I have been asked to talk a little about the TAP technique, and at the end, as we haven't discussed about the V-stenting, though Anil told theoretically, so I would like to show another case of uh, V-stenting. So what is TAP technique? Modification <coughs> of the T-stenting technique, best intentional minimal protrusion, of the side branch stent within the main branch. This technique can be described as follows. A second stent is positioned in the side branch with the aim of protrusion as minimally as possible into the main branch. That is one or two millimeter, thus ensuring complete coverage of the ostium of the side branch. A balloon is advanced in the main branch. The side branch stent is deployed as usual, 12 ATM or more, whatever is required, while the uninflated balloon remains parked in the main branch at the bifurcation. The side branch stent balloon is pulled backward slightly, ensuring that it is still with the, within the main branch stent. Subsequently, FKVI is performed using the side branch balloon and 
previously position main branch balloon at high pressure and preferably final kissing should be done twice because as we know from Dr. Ormiston from New Zealand who is a pioneer in the field of uh, bifurcation stenting and has shown us and taught us from different OCT findings that final twice kissing balloon inflation is better because by the first inflation there is 53% metal in the lumen of the side branch but if you dilate it twice it comes down to 25% of metal in the side branch. The side branch is deflated last and both the balloons are deflated and removed. The side branch stent completely covers the ostium despite some concerns about stent protrusion in the main branch. The tap has become preferred technique when we need to implant a stent in the side branch during a provisional approach because it is easy to perform, doesn't require recrossing of the st uh, side branch starts to perform FKBI like culotte and appears to be associated with good long-term outcome. So this is the left main bifurcation we have been seeing from Dr. Fajila beautiful cases since yesterday. So this was a 57 year old male patient, dyslipidemic, non-smoker, non-diabetic, admitted with acute anterior wall MI some time back and was had a primary PCI in another center. He is normotensive and uh, thrombolysis was done in another hospital before admission to the second hospital. So it was a pharmacoinvasive uh, stenting to LAD, LVF 60% now, LV cavity, mild concentric hypertrophy, <coughs> good RV systolic function, left main bifurcation is there in the angiogram, patient stent to proximal LAD and the stent was completely patent and the patient refused CABG because as a matter of fact in bifurcation stenting we give the option of CABG first because if we look at the history in 2006 it was a class 3 indication by ACC left main bifurcation lesion in 2009 they upgraded it to 2B and then in 2011 they upgraded some of the you know uh, procedures as type uh, class 2A indication. So. Uh, you can see it's a very, very tight lesion with patent stent in the LED. There is a 90% lesion, more than 90% lesion in the distal left main and also the ostium of both circumflex and LED has tight lesions, 90% plus. So we decided that to balloon the, both the branches first, we put two wires. So we have wired both the vessels and dilated with a balloon uh, 2.75 and then the LED, LMT to LED we dilated at 14 atm. So this is the picture after initial uh, balloon dilatation. Then we took circumflex as the main vessel. Uh, and the uh, LED as the side branch. Of course, we knew that two stents will be required, but uh, see the ostium of the LED doesn't look to be too bad after balloon stent, balloon dilatation. So we have put a long DES and we deployed it at uh, 14 atm. And so this is the picture after putting the stent in left main to circumflex lesion. So we can see the patent stent in the proximal LED which was done two years back. So this is the picture after the stent implantation in LMT to LCX. But there is some disease. The IVAS machine was not working on that day. So we couldn't do the IVAS. And this is the second stent. Uh, we have put the stent, keeping some of the stent inside two millimeter of it inside the LMT, and uh, this is the dilatation of the LED LMT to LED stent. And so this is the result, and then we did the final kissing inflation. So these are the stain boost. We had to be satisfied with the stain boost on that day. But stain boost showed uh, good dilatation of both the stains without any star under dilatation of any of the starts of both the stains. So this was the final result.
So the take home message technically left main bifurcation stenting is easy to perform with good results provided guidelines are followed. As we saw yesterday so many cases from Fajila Center and also in her lecture. Uh, this is the second patient where we did the V stenting because we didn't show any case of V stenting so I thought that one V stenting should be shown. And this is a lady patient and a 54 years lady admitted with a stemi trop T was positive was admitted with ongoing chest pain despite adequate medical management in the refer other center from where he, she has been referred and also in our center despite adequate medical management overnight she was having continuous chest pain and he was given everything, dapt and oxaparin, et cetera, et cetera. ECG showed marker ischemia, ST segment, uh, depression and T-wave inversion in both the inferior and the anterior wall leads. Echo showed mild LV systolic dysfunction, EF was 50%. There was mild anteroepical hypokinesia, no M1, no P. And uh, angiogram showed DVD and mild LV systolic dysfunction. So this was the picture and uh, both the LAD and the proximal LCX both were diseased. So we can see that this is Medina uh, 011, but it looks to be because there was no proximal disease. And we thought because the angle is narrow, not too much, it's around 60 degree and uh, the size of both the vessels are equal. These are some of the preconditions before going for the V stenting. So all the criteria were satisfied. So we balloon dilated both the lesion and that's what appears after the initial uh, balloon dilatation. And then so we put two stents, two DES, keeping uh, some amount of protrusion in the proximal branch that is left main and of course pro not producing two lumens because that becomes kissing balloon, uh, kissing stenting, Y stenting at as it is told and then we dilated the, both the stents and we post dilated. So this is the final result. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kali. Great demonstration of uh, several different techniques of uh, uh, bifurcation stenting, yeah. uh, including the V stent, which is w wonderfully done. Uh, my co-chair, any comments, Dr. Madhika? Really beautiful. There's nothing else to comment on this. You achieved the best possible result in the, both the cases. Yeah. So, Dr. It's a great result. Any, any else, anything else you want to add? Use your mic, please. Yeah. First, I would like to congratulate Dr. Kali on this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, the only point uh, that I would like to make is that if uh, you are doing, uh, he, and he, as he said, that intravascular ultrasound was not available on that day. So if you are dealing with a case of instant or peristent restenosis, uh, as was in the LAD, I think there no, was... the LAD stent was patent. But the just, just proximal to it, the stenosis yeah, was... Yeah, the stenosis of the ostium of the LAD. This was was, it, was it near to the stent? Yeah, because you see, if you look at the first stent... Can we see that It was picture long away and after that there was no disease. So actually... It is the, not very stent. Yeah, actually the atherometrous plaque in the distal left main bifurcation progressed to the ostium of the LAD. Okay. But in between the stent and the ostium, it was free of any disease. Okay, so what uh, what uh, intravascular ultrasound, if it is available, it tells you is yeah, that's uh, true. But whether the first, uh, what exactly is yeah. the dimensions of the proximal LED? That's because right. uh, sometimes we tend to underestimate the proximal LED yeah. and undersize. And uh, if you do intravascular ultrasound, you'll always see that it is 3.5 plus. That, yeah. is, that is all I want. But to just say. one point to add, Dev Dotto, that IVAS. Though it's very useful and I don't deny that it's very, very useful and should be done. But, uh, you know, doing IVAS has not reduced the mortality yes. in uh, PCI of left main stenting. But still I tell that it should be done. It Thank was not possible on that day. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Kahali. Thank you.